I just wanted to ask Melissa her experience like when she had to live a job that she was working for all the while and all her career and everything and came down to Preetam right the man of her life how easy was it and uh, for somebody who's young and uh, looking for a partner it, sometimes it's these it's a really simple reason where things can fall apart so if if it's so simple for things to fall apart then why should we you know as youth even consider marriage the reasons why marriage is are breaking down that lack of maturity comes from a young age when people who are young get married the maturity is very less is very low hi and welcome back to another episode of hot rock cafe where we have heartfelt conversations on the solid rock of faith over a cup of hot coffee Today we're going to be continuing in our three-part episode on is marriage a failed institution. For those of you joining us now, you can find the last two episodes in the link in the description. And if you are just tuning in, we have today with us Father John Abraham, Melissa and Preetam De Souza, and three lovely young ladies, Sheila, Martha and Maria. So Father, there's another question that people have is why should the state or the church be involved in my marriage i am with another person i want to decide so why should somebody else come in between so what do you have to say to that yes that's a good question the good thing about a marriage is it affects not just two people it affects two families it affects society when two people are married it affects society and that is why in all marriages civil and in church marriage there always has to be there have to be two witnesses present for the marriage the priest is present there he represents the church he is a witness on the part of the church two witnesses they represent society and the parties give their consent to one another they are the ministers of marriage they are giving the sacrament to one another all the others are only witnesses why does the church want the witness to be there because it affects the church when you two get married how does it affect if you two are not married and you are living in an illicit relationship it affects the church the church says no you are not in the way that god wanted men and women to be god wanted if you are living in a, on an island without anybody around okay god may allow that but if you are living in a society you have to come to the church and in a certain sense bless that marriage and also get that marriage certified by god society says of course marriage affects me what do you think suppose you two unmarried people are living in the same house the whole town or the whole neighborhood will come and say look at these fellows they are not married and they are living together it is prostitution maybe it could be some other kind of evil that affects society so society says you want to live together first come to me get married get yourself certified go and live together well the first thing is it affects society if it doesn't affect them they won't bother baptism it doesn't affect society it affects you and the church the church says i accept you as a child of god as a member of the church society says whether you get baptized or not i don't care and if you took the baptism certificate for getting your passport they'll say take it back i want only your birth certificate so whatever doesn't affect them they don't they don't bother about it but the sacrament of marriage affects the church secondly much more bigger reason when the two people get together and live together children are born children affect the society now if the the, the state does not bother about those children people will not get married they will have children the husband will leave the wife and run away the wife will leave the husband and run away the child will be on the streets he becomes a thief he becomes a murderer he ends up in jail so society says no i cannot allow this to happen if a man has married a woman he must live with her they must take care of each other and if they want to separate they must come to me and get the separation because then i will will order what should be done with regard to the maintenance of the girl what should be done with regard to the maintenance of the children i will take care of all that so you must come to me even if you want to separate the church has similar reasons 
the church says when you get married you have children and i want all children to be brought up in the by the in the grace of god i want them to be baptized i want them to receive holy communion to receive confirmation i want them to grow up as members of the church and finally one day they will also marry in the church so the church is in, is, is uh, as much interested in the children as god is interested and therefore the church says you have to come and get married in the church well you can look at this in the history of marriage itself in the in the early times marriage was just counted as a civil uh, a, a, a civil contract, contract. contract. Right. they went they got married and they came and they lived together the early church the civil marriage was sufficient for the party they only had to come and inform the church say i got married in the civil court and therefore i am married now the church would accept their marriage but as the time went by so at that time the church was more interested in the faith of the couple in the indissolubility of marriage in the uh, unity of marriage unity means one husband one wife so it was more concerned about the theological parts of marriage you find saint augustine you find all the early church fathers all of them writing about the 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 faith the the sanctity the theology of marriage but as the years went by they found that you had to have some method in which you can know that they are really married and therefore the church said after you finish getting married in the court come to me and get that marriage ascertained because at then only i will know that you two are living a holy life then only i can give sacraments for your children etc it went on in they they tried to have marriage in any way any external civilly acceptable way till the council of trent the council of trent was in the year was in the middle of the 16th century 1560 odd it ended the council of trent it was decreed that if two people want to get married husband boy and a girl they can get married only in the presence of the church that means the priest in the presence of two witnesses in the church or the priest and two witnesses or the priest and somebody whom the priest delegates the bishop or anyone who whom he delegates so this is called as the form of marriage so to be this canon 100000 116 uh, eight which says that this is the form of marriage you can marry you you are getting if you are getting married you should give your consent in the presence of the pre, the parish priest or the local ordinary or a priest or deacon delegated by either of them and in the presence of two witnesses that's all is the reason, the form of marriage so this is now it is lasting from 1560 till now the same form of marriage is lasting and it is a good enough form wherein uh, uh, like they say no we need three people to get married uh, the priest <laughs> is there right. and the ch- god is there it's in the church and society is there and in front of all these three people they are promising i will accept you you cannot have a bigger promise god the church society nothing else is there before whom you can promise so you call these three powers to witness to your consent and that consent can never be broken according to the church it's an indissoluble union uh pritham as a lawyer do you have anything that you want to add yeah it is quite interesting in terms of how the marriage evolved as a sacrament meaning uh, with the trent council of trent i think uh, like you know just to pick on from where you uh, left i think it is uh, what you mentioned was a civil marriage which was certified by the church until then uh, so what has happened after that really is uh, you know the church marriage now is the other way around where once they once you get married in the church this marriage is certified by the state so even though you go get married you go to the uh, the registrar marriage registrar and you have that certification issued and the state issues the certificate which is statutorily prescribed uh, to recognizing the marriage that has happened in the church so uh, the the play has actually worked the other way around since the last 500 years or so so apart from that in terms of uh, why the state uh it's so important for the state the marriage my why marriage is so important for the state i think there are a certain few other things that are applicable at least uh, that uh, that uh, that are applicable to a state a whole lot of the uh, laws that we have a whole lot of rights that are accrued to an individual uh, 
in terms of property, in terms of maintenance, in terms of well-being, in terms of so uh, uh, societal benefits and so on are attached to marriage currently. Uh, so in terms of your status as a man or woman uh, in a marriage, uh, you have a special status under law for that matter which you can uh, get benefit from. So, of course, uh, lately in the last few years, uh, some of those rights have been diluted with uh, the, the recognition of live-in marriages, uh, live-in relationships being accorded the same status as marriage and so on. But by and large, uh, the whole lot of those rights continue to exist, very specifically with regard to property laws. They still continue to exist and uh, it may still take a while before they are also diluted in terms of the, in, in, in the context of the live-in relationship uh, laws that are coming in play. Uh, but by and large, I think the state has its interest in ensuring that uh, those, those rights that are recorded to individuals are safeguarded by the institution of marriage in itself. So that is the intent of the state here in going ahead and focusing on marriages very specifically. Perfect. So Pritam, you raised a very interesting point uh, where you said that the state now accepts um, live-in as a, a way of being. It's equivalent to marriage, right? It's, it's accepted that now. So if uh, now, I as a young person, I'm seeing how difficult marriages can be. I'm looking at my peers and saying people are getting divorced, people are separating. <coughs> and it, it's, a, uh, it's a, a very difficult way of being, having to compromise for another person. And you have all these other options of living or not, or living apart from each other and be, just still being married. Then why would somebody who's, uh, you know, even discerning marriage consider marriage as an option? Why, would, why wouldn't you just, you know, perhaps go in for something more convenient, more comfortable? Well, there's an, you, if it's not working, you, you move and you can find something that makes you happy. So for me, uh, the very idea of a live-in marriage, live-in relationship for that matter, comes from our uh, current culture of uh, uh, use and throw, okay. literally use and throw, yeah. or for that matter, the, the inherent, like I said, the inherent desire to be selfish. Yeah. You know, uh, it's all about me. Uh, you enter into a relationship. Uh, merely because you want to derive everything and anything and everything that you can from that relationship yeah. and nothing more, nothing less. Yeah. So there is nothing more to that relationship than just that. So I, 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 I definitely don't believe you'll find it as a surprise that if you look at statistics, uh, living relationships are, are not something that are long lasting. They're not, uh, the, and people who go through them momentarily do find pleasure. For some time, they will find some amount of joy, uh, but there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that they will find everlasting satisfaction, joy, and fulfillment from that um, uh, from, from that relationship itself. And uh, in itself, it's not an institution. Yeah. Uh, there are a whole lot of flaws that are attached to that, uh, as regards uh, children, most importantly. Yeah. What 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 the uh, what the state really has neglected in terms of the current laws and uh, the dilution that has been happening is. Uh, the very crux of why a marriage in terms of uh, procreation as to what, what about the children. Uh, so that has not been given much thought and that is going to be a disaster, a huge disaster because that is a, uh, that is a automatic consequence, a natural consequence of any kind of a, a heterosexual relationship. So you can't ignore that and that's not something that you can throw away or you know put under the carpet and say oh, never mind as long as they are happy uh, everything should be good because that is a vital part and critical part of what the society is looking at future citizens yeah. and uh, if the future citizens are going to be flawed uh, men and women coming out of this particular uh, environment uh, environment where the parents itself there is no stability uh, in terms of uh, the parents what they're looking at there's no there's no stability in terms of the family uh, there are no real uh, they, they don't really see genuine love uh, in in the in that in that in that setup in that structure that they're looking at then end of the day we are going to be having a whole lot of psychological issues mm -hmm. there are going to be tons and tons of problems and as liberal as that we can get with uh, with all these ideas about uh, having a relation uh, living relationship and uh, allowing that in our societies having laws to uh, allow for that uh, extending the rights of marriage uh, mar marriage to these uh, relationships and so on end of the day what we are doing is opening a pandora's box mm -hmm. of uh, disastrous consequences mm -hmm. and i think that's that's where we are right now we are in the threshold of entering into that era which is very scary which is very uh, right so uh, another question I have for that is that also 
as youth now, if we're not considering um, marriage as the end all and people are in relationships, um, then the idea is you go through a whole dating phase, right? There's that, there's that also that it's, it's a reality that's happening right now. Um, and I saw this very interesting quote um, on online, which said that, you know, the, the use and throw culture that you were talking about, it extends to your whole, you meet a person and you, you see if you can work things out. And if it doesn't work out, then you say, okay, it's not meant to be and you move, move on. But that you're uh, subconsciously um, imbibing that whole use and throw with people. And so when it comes down to making something work long term, it's not going to happen because you've ingrained that into your system. But also there is the idea that if you don't have um, any experience at all with people, then how do you navigate marriage with another person? So what do you think um, is your opinion on perhaps dating or exploring relationships before marriage? Very good question. Very specially, uh, it's applicable for India. Yeah. <clears throat> we said that uh, uh, boys and girls do not mix with each other in present society. But unless they really mix with each other, they cannot know one another. Parents cannot know the, 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 um, the behavior and the in, of the boy without really being, meeting with him. Yeah. Parents will not give you a very clear explanation of how that person is. Now, to understand that, boys and girls can meet each other, can date each other, can go out together with each other, can be private with each other. They have to know very clearly the theology of the body. What is your body for? Why did God make your body? How should you treat your body and the bodies of others? We must talk about that. They should be clearly taught about how you must respect your body and respect the other person's body. Secondly, after they come to know one another, they want to uh, uh, get married or they don't want to get married. When you started your question of use and throw, what came to my mind is what used to happen in the 1950s, 60s, early 70s. It was the culture of the hippies. The hippies said free love. We gather, we come together, each one take anyone you want. Anytime you want, you can leave her or leave him. You are not stuck to anybody. Let us have a free love culture in the world. It was such a widespread hippie culture. And all that came out of it was misery, unwanted children yeah. and, and at that time they never even had the abortion yeah. or they never even had the pills right. that's why when the the pills came it was a revolution in the whole world they said now we can have free love yeah. because we can always avoid the children yeah. so the value of life was totally lost with this free culture then society also realized the church has always propagated it that marriage is sacred your body is sacred. The other person is sacred. And so if the boy and girl can understand that without going to a free love kind of a culture, they can come to know of each other. But if they don't understand that and they go through what their bodies are aching for, namely sex, they have totally destroyed one another. You tell me in India, how many people will be there who if they know that this girl has had sex with another man regularly, has had a child and has aborted it, will you marry that girl? 99.9% .9 of the people will say, no, I don't want her. Then whom do you want? I want a virgin. I want at least somebody who knows the value of a sexual relationship. So if in what we are telling about live in relationships, it is the stepping stone for a disaster life. Now, they cannot have sexual relationships so easily in India because uh, everywhere you go, there are people who see you. Right. So the best thing is let's have a home. You government, you accept that we both can live together in that home. The government says, okay, go ahead. Because of the pressure from the, from the culture, from the peers. So they go. 
and it's known to everybody that they are having sex, then in the end it's known that they cannot manage with one another, they separate. Abroad, at least I see in movies, where the day she leaves one man's house, she can enter into another man's house. Because his wife, his girl also has left him. She has come to this fellow, he has gone to that girl. So they are just sharing one another and it's a kind of, um, what you call, a chess, game of chess. Each one's going to the other. And what will that end up in? As Preetam said, it will end up in a whole disaster world. And then somebody will say, what did God really will? Did he will marriages? And if you say marriage is a failure, then this is a success. And if this is a success, your world is a failure. Your whole life is a failure. And so the very, the very uh, catchy phrase, a live-in relationship. I'm living in a live-in relationship. I don't marry him, I just stay with him. What do you do staying with him? I have sex with him. What do you do if you're going to have children? I abort the child. I kill the child. I use pills to avoid the child. And so what are you doing? You're doing everything against the law of God. And not what is the law of God? The law of God is what God has put into my own whole soul, which I desire. I want children, but I'm destroying children. I want to have a faithful relationship, but I don't, uh, my, I, I don't want to be faithful. So all these cultures which we are talking of now end up in just that. So if the whole world is filled with living relationships, life on earth is a disaster. The plan of God is a disaster. And I can assure you, nobody will want children. And when children are gone, the earth will be empty. There will no more be paid people on this earth. So my point is, God willed a chaste culture for man and woman. God willed a permanent relationship for, for a man and a woman. God willed that they should be blessed with the sacrament of marriage, or at least God accept an, a, 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 a relationship which is acceptable to God and society. Perfect, Father. In terms of what you just said, I, I uh, you know, what comes to my mind is uh, the 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 sanctity of what our bodies are about, uh, what sex is about, and what marriage is about. Uh, and I think this is not just uh, limited only to uh, you know uh, after marriage. You know, in the context of what you asked, you know, about dating, uh, something that we actually do uh, in our community where we have a ministry of singles and invariably uh, the, each of the, there are, uh, there are a whole lot of singles who end up having relationships with one another in the ministry itself. It's a natural process that it is bound to happen and something that is beautiful if you look at it in the, in the right sense. And uh, what we actually do is we go ahead and lead them in that relationship to a, in a life of chastity. We get them to an understanding that it is not wrong to have that attraction to one another. It's actually beautiful. It's a gift of God to be attracted to one another. It's awesome. Uh, but how you're going to be living out that attraction, that uh, sensuality that you experience with one another is what really matters and what is your walk to spirituality. So we give them an understanding of what it means to have this body of this. What, what is the intent? What is the purpose? From basically from the theology of the body. We give them an understanding of sex, body and uh, the sacrament of marriage from that. And lead them on into that battle to live a chaste life, to have a chaste relationship in that relationship with that person that they are entering into in, in the dating uh, situation over, over the next few months in, with the consent of their parents and so on. Uh, during the walk with them through that journey towards marriage. And as they enter marriage, we go ahead and gi give them an understanding of what marriage is about. Uh, so, so from with that, they have not just gone ahead and uh, gone, gone ahead and uh, lived out their uh, call towards uh, marriage and discerned their life towards marriage, but they've also lived out their spiritual walk uh, towards perfection, towards experiencing Christ in that relationship. So I think that's something that's beautiful. And if that's something that we can uh, do more, you know, get people to understand what it means to live a life of chastity, not just, uh, you know, talk, sometimes when you talk of chastity, sometimes it's only limited to, uh, to the realm of singlehood. Uh, bachelor, when, when you're a bachelor or a spinster, or for that matter, in some context, uh, people fail to understand that the chastity could also be as part of our marriages. Uh, so when it comes to marriages, I think uh, that point where we was, you were speaking about, where uh, divorces happen, 
uh, and uh, in the context i see it in most more more in the context of why men want divorces and a lot of times when i come across our discussion with our uh, couples i i find that a lot of times their the reason why they are more inclined to have a separation to walk away from their marriages or they're so dissatisfied in their marriages is that the couple in the marriage has been struggling with living a life of chastity uh, especially in a catholic marriage uh, and it gets more and more difficult Uh, to live a life of chastity when they uh, when when they, as as they grow in their marriages as they have children and as they uh, during the times of uh, abstinence and so on so but i think that is a challenge in itself and a lot of times that i find separation the reason people couple want uh, the man wants most importantly to separate is simply because of this because he has the desire to the inclination the natural inclination for a sexual union uh, continually continued as opposed to uh, the woman uh, which is naturally not that uh, you know it is not as continuous and as as uh, as urgent as 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 a man as for a man so there is that inconsistency uh, which is quite natural between the two and they find it very difficult to go ahead and align that between the two of them which can only be done when they and they can understand what their bodies are about and what their marriage is about and the fact that the sexual relationship was never about it's not about them it's about giving themselves to their spouse so that is that's my uh, take on uh, uh, the three things that you actually spoke about yeah if i could add something on what is the theology of the body that we are all talking of <clears throat> pope john paul the second has written about it and he was very very insistent on people understanding the theology of the body the theology of the body starts with the last supper jesus takes bread he blesses it and breaks it and gives it to his apostles and says take and eat this is my body he takes the cup of wine blesses it and gives to the disciples saying drink it all of you this is my blood jesus was giving his body to the world do this in memory of me god was giving his body to mankind why did god give his body to mankind jesus had given everything he had given his time to the world he had given his riches to the world he had given his intelligence to the world he had given everything even his life on the cross he would give to the world there was one thing that still belonged to jesus which he had not given that was his body and since jesus is god he could take bread turn it into his body and give it to his apostles and say here eat it this is my body that means he gave through giving that body he gave himself totally to the world there was nothing that he held back everything was man's including this body now we come to that point of his body giving his body all of us on the earth give ourselves to one another and we call that love when i give my time to another when i give my possessions to another when i give my intelligence and knowledge to another when i give my talents to another well it's all love out of love we do that we even give our life to others a man who is going to the war for his country is giving his life for all the people of his country there's one thing that he does not give to his country there's one thing that he does not give to all peoples he can give it only to one person and that is his wife or his husband her husband that is his body even the parents cannot give their okay they they conceived he conceived through them but after growing they cannot give their bodies to the other a mother cannot tell her son son i would like to give my body to you how do i give my body to you well there's only one way in which we give our bodies to another and that is through the sexual union the conjugal union we call it a mother cannot give it to her son father cannot give it to his daughter brothers cannot give to their sisters however close your friendship may be if it is only a friendship you cannot give your body to another it is something sacred and which can be given to only one person and that is your spouse the moment you separate your time 
you can give it to two people. The moment you separate your possessions, you can give to a number of people. But the moment you cut your body, it's no more you. You can give it to one. And that is why the church does not allow bigamy. It doesn't allow two wives or two husbands. Because if I tell the husband, if the girl tells the husband, I give myself totally to you, I'm marrying you. She cannot look at another man and say, I'm giving myself totally to you. Either the first one is a lie or the second is a lie. You can only give yourself totally to one person and that will be your spouse. So in Christian, in Christian theology, there's only one spouse which you can have. And that is because you have one body and you give that one body to another person. The, the very words that you read in the scripture, the moment Jesus died, what did he say? What were the words he said? It is consummated. Consumatum est. What is that word consummation used for? It is used for a husband and wife when they have relationship with one another, a conjugal union. Why does the church bring, why did God bring that word of a conjugal union, which is a consummation of marriage into the words of Jesus on the cross? Because that was his consummation. He said, I've given everything to you. Here, my body is broken for you. My blood is shed for you. Well, that is the way we must understand the body. And if you don't give your body, no matter whatever things you give, you are not giving yourself totally. You're not giving yourself totally. Why is it that a husband must save his wife if they're both going in a bo on a boat, his wife and his mother, and the boat, boat overturns? He can save only one person. Whom is he going to save? His mother or his wife? Everyone will say his mother. Because I can always get another <laughs> wife, but I cannot get another mother in my life. The church will say, no, you have to save your wife. Because your mother's love is instinct. You never promised her love. She never promised you love. It comes automatically from your heart. But for the wife, you have promised her, I will love you before God, before the church, before society. You have made a promise and you cannot sacrifice that promise for something that is of an instinctive nature. So you have to save your wife. So the meaning is that you can give your body only to one person. So that consummation is the theology of the body. We give ourselves to Christ. We, we human beings in marriage give themselves to one another. That's how people in the marriage should understand. My having sex with my husband is not just, just for pleasure, not just for, the, for, the, for uh, entertainment. I'm doing something which, no, which I cannot do to anyone. That means I'm giving myself totally to you. So we come to that and with that, in, when, you, when you remove all these things out of marriage, a living relationship becomes empty. What are you doing in a living relationship? The only meaning is I want to have sex with her and without any problems. I can leave her, I can come. So as uh, Preetam already said, yes, you will be killing so many children by abortion if you are having a living relationship. You will be killing so much of God's plan and your own love you will be destroying because you will be using a condom. You will be avoiding and you are destroying yourselves. And as he told, it will never last forever. As I told in the beginning, it started off with the hippie, hippie in our generation at least this time. It started with the hippie uh, type of living. France even had an experiment of living relationship without marriage and they realized it's an utter failure and so they gave up that idea. I think India without, without uh, experimenting on it should not really go in for living relationships because it does not end in, in success at all. I think that's a very good point father uh, because a lot of the times you know uh, people our age are going to be influenced by what we see and there's a lot of celebrity culture. So uh, it, it, it's good to have, um, you know, the church kind of inform your decisions because if you're looking at, you're looking at pop culture and you're looking at what's out there, it encourages you to be happy. So if you have to be happy and your person's not providing that for you, then you should leave them. That's the acceptable approach. So um, I think it would be nice now to perhaps talk about 
uh, the different ways in which we can prepare ourselves, even if we're looking to towards the idea of a relationship or marriage. Father, how to overcome the fear of marriage? Um, my question is, in this whole hunt for the man or the woman of your life, right? We get lost into this whole choice, actually. How do we overcome that? Because sometimes I feel like that itself is very stressing out. Like. So my question is, uh, so when a young man or a young woman wants to become a priest or a nun, uh, so they are put into this formation for at least seven years or more, and they get the time to, they are put into this intense routine where they also get to decide whether they are called to it or not, and, and the church also gets to say something about their calling. And in the end, only the people who are eligible and who are who really pass through that formation go and go to the next step. But when it comes to marriage, uh, for example, if I, I desire marriage, but for me to discern that readiness for marriage, for me to be ready for marriage, what can I do to get myself ready for marriage? What formation can I put myself into? And what, what does the church have to offer me for that? Thank you for joining us on another episode of Heart Rock Cafe, where we have heartfelt conversations on the solid rock of faith over a cup of hot coffee. We will be taking a break now, but there's great news. There's another episode coming out where we continue our conversation today. And we're excited to see you there. But till then, you can leave a comment, hit the like button and subscribe to us so that we can continue to make this content for you. Till next time.